Hello, and welcome to the ninth Food Safety Culture webinar in our series. We're so pleased to have you join us today for this very special event as we talk about storytelling to shape, reinforce, and inspire food safety culture. For those of you who are joining for the very first time, my name is Vanessa Kaufman. I'm the director of the Alliance to Stop Foodborne Illness, a program which brings together consumers, industry, academics, and regulators to work on food safety culture collaboratively throughout the food system. I, along with Conrad Schwarnier from the US Food and Drug Administration, will serve as your moderators for today's event. This session is a bit different than those in the past, as we will hear from a Stop Foodborne Illness constituent advocate, Jeff Almer, and have a brief conversation with him before turning the mic over to Jorge Hernandez, Vice President of Quality Assurance at the Wendy's Company. Jorge will share how he's employed storytelling across his esteemed career and give examples of it in action at Wendy's. Before we dive in, I wanna remind everyone that the chat function, microphones, and your cameras are disabled. You will need to use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists. In the Q&A window, you can upvote questions and the most popular will rise to the top. As always, you can earn one continuing education credit for each webinar in the series, so nine total. The details are posted on the STOP website and will be distributed by email on Friday. You will also find a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides on the STOP website. And as always, please be aware this webinar is being recorded. Now, I don't wanna to take too much time because I know that Conrad and Lone have a lot to talk about with Jeff and our viewers are interested and eager to ask their questions. But I did wanna mention a bit about Stop Foodborne Illness, the organization that houses the Alliance program and how it's used storytelling as a vehicle for change. Stop was founded 30 years ago by the parents of children who died in the Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak. This includes little Alex, who's pictured here on our Food Poisoning Stories page. In the wake of the 1993 outbreak, Alex's mom, Nancy, and the other families banded together and wanting to make meaning of this horrible and completely avoidable tragedy, used their experiences to compel regulators and companies to make much needed improvements. You can visit our website, stopfoodborneillness.org, and you can find the URL up at the top of your screen to read more about that fight and find hundreds of stories that may serve to help advance the food safety culture in your own organization. One of the stories on the Stop Foodborne Illness page is that of Jeff Almer's mom, Shirley. Shirley survived cancer twice, only to finally succumb to salmonella poisoning on December 21st, 2008, as a result of eating contaminated peanut butter from the now infamous Peanut Corporation of America. Jeff, Jeff has spent countless time, energy, and heartache sharing Shirley's story to fight for food reforms alongside STOP and the other constituents impacted by PCA. I don't want to steal Jeff's thunder, but I always am struck by the closing sentences of his story and want to share them with you all. Jeff writes, we cannot allow food safety to be continually underfunded, exposing unsuspecting Americans to deadly pathogens. We need strong laws, regulations, and effective enforcement to protect our families. Cancer couldn't claim her, but peanut butter did. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Jeff Conrad and Lone Jesperson for a conversation about why Jeff has continued to share his story even 15 years on. Take it away. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us again for this webinar. Um, by, by FDN Stop Foodborne Illness and um, it's always very grounding to hear the kind of story that you just shared Vanessa so thank you so much. Before we kick into it Jeff um, I, as you know Conrad and I have a couple of questions for you that we'd like to just uh, talk through and um, maybe you can kick us off um, tell us tell us your story about Shirley your mom. Sure thank you thank you Lone. Um... Happy uh, December 6th, to everybody. I just want to thank you for your interest. Um, and what I have to say here, uh, in um, 15 days, it'll be 15 years since my mom passed away. And in that time, uh, I can't believe I'm still talking about some of the same issues occurring. And so that's what really uh, continues to motivate me 
because I feel like the job's not finished. Uh, hmm. And basically a bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in a family of five. My mom was came from a family that her parents lived to 100 years old each. And so we expected to have her with us quite a while. She died at age 72 after beating cancer. And uh, one, of, one of the cancer episodes was brain cancer, if you can believe that. Uh, she was declared cancer free. And we had to accept the fact that she died from eating some contaminated food, specifically peanut butter in the Peanut Butter Corporation of America uh, salmonella outbreak. And so prior to her passing, um, we thought she had died from pneumonia and uh, found out later a few weeks afterwards that it was from salmonella. And not only were we grieving, but we were also angry. And I think to this day, I continue to have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because uh, as I said before, there's unfinished business I think we need to get to. And that continues to drive and to make sense of my mom's death and to have something positive come out of it, even we're at 15 years now and counting. So that's pretty much why I'm involved and why I continue to be involved. Yeah. And um, I can only thank you for your persistency and also for your courage to keep sh sharing something that's so personal to obviously you and your family. Um, thank you, Jeff. As you know, we're talking about um, storytelling um, and you are a, a master storyteller and, and would like to offer up some learnings based on what you do and how you drive change, uh, both in behaviors and the industry based on your, your tragic story with your mom. Um, would you be able to maybe tell us a little bit about how that is a that story that you tell you just shared with us and how you use storytelling as well. What in your mind, what makes it an effective storytelling, Jim? Um, I think the fact that I speak from the heart, the fact that I don't pause a lot and say, um, <laughs> you know, little things like that. You, you have to engage your audience and ha and you don't want to bore them and go into too much detail but you want them to relate to what happened to you as something that could happen to them. It, it, you know, what, what are the odds of my mom having what happened to her happen? And the fact that all of a sudden here, I'm a guy that, you know, I'm sitting here in Minnesota for years, not following politics, not following food safety at all. And I got thrust into this role where now I'm appearing before, you know, Congress twice speaking to senators um, doing TV appearances. It, it's just crazy uh, in, in my, to my benefit, to be able to be an effective storyteller. I think I wore my, you know, wear my heart on my sleeve. I try to stay with the facts and, you know, I don't want to use big words, although sometimes I threw big words out just for my own, you know, amusement, just to see it quoted in the paper or something. Um, and what's funny is I know that the media sometimes like sound bites, right? So I, when I would say a speech, for example, we did a press conference to try and put more pressure on the Justice Department. And Stuart Parnell, the CEO, had not been charged with anything at that time. And I remember ending my speech saying that it was time to roast Mr. Peanut. And I thought... The, me the media just love that. And I saw it quoted then the next day. I mean, it amused me, but it also made sure that they would say something or repeat something that I had said. And people remember things like that. So I think that's a good characteristic of an effective storyteller. And I, I, I could say my first attorney I had in this whole situation, at one point he said to me, I'll never forget, he said to me that, you know, Jeff, the, you got to be careful because the media is just using you. And I said, uh, I said, I realize that, but don't you realize that I'm using them? I'm using them for my advantage. 
And I said, I know they're not going to call me Christmas time and ask how I'm doing. They're out there to get the story. And so I'm going to say what I think will pique their interest and people will pay attention to. And, and I, I like how you put that. Um, there's some mutual give and take there between those that receive a story and also those that tell the story. Um, and I think that's a real good segue, Conrad, uh, into some of the questions we have, have around impact on behaviors um, when it comes to storytelling. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, Jeff, I, 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 as you've been telling your story, I'm sure you've been encountering a whole bunch of different reactions and and hopefully you've been seeing some positive reactions and behavior changes, but wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, either, uh, you know, the instances where you've seen behaviors change in the way you want them to, and, and maybe even when you've seen behaviors that you didn't expect or or were, were kind of negative. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny. It, it hasn't happened very much, but when I first got involved with everything, um, there was a local restaurant here that I noticed they got charged with, they were literally grabbing meat out of the dumpster and they got charged with that. And one of my coworkers, that was her favorite restaurant and she didn't want to hear about that. You know, so I think to some degree people, it's kind of the old uh, saying that ignorance is bliss. They don't want to know about it because they feel helpless. And so hearing about it makes them feel, you know, worse with also feeling helpless. But for the most part, I have had people reach out to me. Um, the other day I heard from a former boss who I haven't talked to for three years. She just watched the Netflix documentary Poisoned and still had my phone number and texted me. Um, I had a, a guy I used to work with who retired a year ago, moved out to Utah, uh, texted me out of the blue. And so I think I've piqued the interest in people that know me and have paid more attention to that. And, and even at holiday time, I, I see my sister or my brother um, making sure to wash their hands when preparing food, when cutting something up. And, and I think just just little, little things like that, they may seem insignificant, but as we all know, uh, that can you can get sick from somebody who hasn't washed their hands who's preparing food. So I, I, I find that interesting that people have paid attention for the most part. And I, I've actually had people come to me with problems that they have maybe at a restaurant or they, they want my advice. So, I mean, I said, I after I had been on the front page of the paper regarding all this, I had calls from all over the state some guy in Duluth had an issue and wanted, he wanted to know how he got action out of the government. Um, so it's been a little crazy, uh, not for quite a while, we're, we're a few years out now, but uh, people have paid attention more. <clears throat> if, if we look at um, you, so I'm gonna put it this way, um, you unfortunately, have a personal story to share. Um, thankfully, most people don't. And um, what, how would you, what kind of advice, Jeff, would you give to somebody that you said it before, you wear your heart on your sleeve? Obviously, your message is very genuine because of the profound loss to you. Um, what advice would you give to somebody that does not have that? emotional connection to a story how do how do you tell a convincing story about food safety um i think as i said i never paid attention to food safety and when my mom died it obviously resonated with me and i tried to i'm a person who stays positive in life and i literally was writing one of my local politicians volunteering my assistance in any way I could about food safety without knowing what to do or where to turn. And that was literally the next day I got a, a call from my attorney when Stop had reached out to my attorney and wanted to get a hold of me. So they gave me the avenue to pursue that. Yeah. So I think I think having 
people that are familiar with the situation that can release you, you know, kind of into the wild to talk about things. And again, if, if you say it's somebody that without um, a personal story, but if it's somebody that cons is concerned or cares about the issue, you know, it, it could be the same thing with homelessness or anything else, something you're not personally involved with. Somebody who takes care, who looks at, who researches a little bit into it and, and just reads about true stories and facts that matter. And um, I'll remember, I remember the first interview I did, one of the first things that I came across looking into food safety uh, was little things that seemed insane to me without even knowing the whole setup was, uh, I recall seeing that the USDA checked pepperoni pizza and the FDA checked cheese pizza. And I thought that was kind of crazy. And before my mom's outbreak, there was a massive outbreak with contaminated tomatoes. And I recall reading that uh, there were not enough inspectors in the field. And the FDA, uh, you know, it, it's involved with, uh, you know, uh, medical devices as well. There were actual medical device inspectors that were walking in the fields with boots on, helping look for contamination. That was another thing I thought was crazy. So I, you know, that was just researching it on my own. True, I had the story related to it, but just facts and I, and I think knowing the situation a little bit, if you're concerned about something is the way to engage others. I think I hear you say, make it personal, be genuine, have the facts, um, share your concern. So even if, if it's not something you have personal experiences in, I think we can all be personal, genuine, use the facts and share our concerns. I think those are a great pieces of advice from you, Jeff. I, I'm definitely going to take those away. So Conrad, um, what, what do you think about advice here from Jeff? Any, any follow-up from you? Well, I do want to hear more about um, any advice you might have. Um, we have a whole audience of food safety professionals here today from industry and government and others listening and listening in. And so I want you maybe as we listen to our next speaker to think about what advice you might have for those individuals. And then I'll, I'll come back to you during the Q&A with, uh, with that hard question for you. Sure, I, I mean, I'll give you a couple examples. My, my brother works for a cheese manufacturer, dairy uh, company. And after all this started happening, I remember they were having a team meeting. This is up in Northern Minnesota, three hours away from me. And my brother called me and he said the, the janitor that worked there interrupted everyone and said that uh, there's a guy here whose brother is very involved with food safety. I think we need to pay attention to what we're doing. <laughs> like I'm, I'm this, you know, aura that's out there, you know, looking at things. Um, but I would say for people that, you know, professionals, when I was dealing with my mom, uh, in the rehab center, there was an, a day where I walked in there and they told me my, my mom had been doing great. They told me my mom was actively dying that day. And that was quite the shock. I ended up calling people. Um, and while I'm there, her doctor came over from the university and took one look at her and said, they're giving her the wrong medication. And that, that really angered me. You know, I dealt with all of that for that reason. So once they gave her the right medication, she was fine. And it came to a issue of, I think when you don't, when you become detached and don't think about what you're doing and how that affects people down the line, I, I, I believe the person that gave her the wrong medication just kind of looked at her as another bed and another name on a piece of paper on the chart that she had to attend to and didn't think about anything beyond that. And along those lines, um, besides my mom, besides food safety issues, my mom's case involved criminal activity. And I was frustrated with the lack of action by the, uh, the Department of Justice. So I actually forced a meeting 
with the FBI in Washington, D.C. through my uh, Senator Franken when he was in office through his general counsel. And my goal that day was for them to see an actual person uh, and not just a case on a piece of paper. And I had a two hour, very productive meeting with them. And what ended up happening from that meeting, three years later, if you fast forward, the case actually came to a trial and they were found guilty, multiple, multiple counts. The CEO was found guilty on 75 counts, I believe. And I'll never forget the lead attorney in the case who I'd met with three years earlier. Um, I looked at him and I was kidding him. And I said, I, I'm sorry, I've been a pain in your butt for five years, but you're not out of the woods yet. And I kind of laughed and I looked at him and he had, he actually had tears in his eyes. And he said, you made us care about this case. And it felt like I was in the middle of some dramatic movie, you know, and I, I've had more than one person say I was the Aaron Brockovich of food safety, which I find funny because there's no way I look like uh, Julia Roberts. But my point is, is that somehow professionals need to be cognizant that their actions down the line can have real effects on a real person's life. And I think we all need to stay positive in life with whatever is going on. And, and try and move on from from whatever is, is bringing you down. And so I think that's my best advice is to to think about your actions do have consequences. It's sometimes hard to hard to remember that when you do the same thing every day and you don't see effects on the other end. Great. Um, Thank, thanks, Jeff. And um, definitely, I'm sure there's going to be some questions for you at the end from our audience. Um, and I think that's a great segue to our next speaker, who is going to talk a little bit about how we can bring storytelling into the uh, into the workplace. Um, so our next speaker, uh, Jorge Hernandez, he has nearly 40 years in the food industry, started out as a sanitarian, worked for the National Restaurant Association and U.S. Foods, and is now as the Quality Assurance VP at Wendy's. Uh, he has used storytelling throughout his career to improve food safety culture, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the stories he has to share today. Jorge? Yes, thank you, Conrad. First of all, let me let me start by thanking, uh, you know, the FDA and the Staff Football Union for the opportunity to share my experiences, you know, and, and the things that I have been able to see uh, uh, work for me, uh, you know, in my uh, long career in food safety. Uh, you know, just a little bit, a couple of remarks on the background that the current just shared with me. You know, I, I started my career as a regulator. Then I went to work for the National Restaurant Association, developing trained materials for the food industry, for the restaurants in particular. We we launched SourceSafe when I was there. And then I went to that to work with the U.S. Foods, you know, second largest distributor in the United States. And after that, I worked for a couple of years with a small, fast, casual chain of Indian restaurants called Chula, mostly in the East West. But uh, then that led me to Wendy's. The point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to food safety, I have been able to talk to all kinds of people, you know, um, you know, from frontline employees to men managers to persons in charge of a restaurant, district managers, corporate staff. And throughout the entire career, mostly the last uh, three jobs I've reported to C-level, meaning CEOs or, or, or senior level officials at the organizations. And uh, one of the things that is critical to food safety or the adoption of food safety is communication, okay? All of the experiences that I have through my career have highlighted the importance of good communications to ensure food safety, you know, it, it's, it's handled appropriately. But more important, they also, these experiences have highlighted for me the amazing power the storytelling can have in communications. Uh, at least you're gonna to click to the next slide, please. In my experience, Storytelling as a way to communicate for safety can only help land your message, but it can also have lasting impact into the audience. And in my experience, you know, I, I, I land this uh, impact into a in simple guide, you know, into three areas that I have used uh, uh, in my positions throughout my career. If you want to click the next one, please. Sometimes those stories allow us to inform the audience of something. Use the story to connect the audience with facts and their importance. I use that usually, you know, to connect the importance of temperatures, uh, times, or, or things that will be able to do that. 
if I do it right, you know, that people understand and get informed about what are the things to do that. But there is a next level that, you know, that as, as, as Elise pointed out with the next click, and it's to educate. Educate is a level up. It is not only about learning the facts, but you, you use the story to give instruction for the audience, usually to provide the why and consequences expecting of what those things that are you're telling them to do uh, have an impact on the people uh, that are going to be eating the food or the people who are going to be, you know, you know, subsequently to your job. Uh, a lot of times this education is part of your job, it's part of what you do. Uh, you know, examples of this, you know, that I've used in the past is the importance of why you wash your hands and how you wash your hands. You know, what is the importance of not coming to work when you were sick and the things that can happen to be able to do that. Relating stories like Jeff, not unlike Jeff or other ones, you know, of things that had happened when those situations have not been handled the right way. And what is the right way to do it and work within a food service establishment, you know, whatever it is that you're doing and, and, and why that is very critical to the success of, of the job, but the importance, you know, the responsibility you have to your audience. And then again, you know, storytelling can give you even up giving you an open door to even a higher level, what I call influence. Influence is even a higher level to educate. Is the capacity to use storytelling to form a connection with the listens, with the listener in the audience to influence his or her behavior going forward. Not only at work, but in their personal life. You know, it is amazing when, when I know that I reach the level is when I get comments back from the people that I'm talking to. And this goes to all levels and they come back and said, Orke, you know, I hate you. You ruined my Christmas or you ruined my Thanksgiving. In one situation, uh, I had somebody said, my grandmother wants to talk to you. And they're referring to the fact that they no longer can go eat without looking for things that are hot. They can no longer can be silent in, you know, in, in, a, in a Christmas gathering or in a Thanksgiving night without making everybody wash their hands or put the, the, you know, the, their, um, their leftovers away right away or things of that sort, right? I, again, you know, the story uh, of, of somebody telling me that, that his grandmother wanted to talk to me is real. And actually, you know, because I, I remember they had a potluck at their house and he had just heard me talk and we were talking about food safety and the importance. They gave some stories about things that had happened. And he related to them, you know, and, and it actually frustrated the grandmother. And I said, well, I've been doing this for a long time and I never killed anybody. I am sure a lot of you guys have heard that before. But, but this, uh, uh, he was a, a four-line employee and said, you know, or he said this and here, you know, some articles, you know, the newspaper and stuff like that. He said, well, I want to talk to this Jorge guy because I'm not sure that I believe him. Actually, talk to her, and I explained to her, you know, about food, about uh, foodborne illness and things like that. And I actually, she said, you know, you just make my life more complicated. Not have to worry about washing my hands and putting things away and stuff like that. But I thank you for that. In that situation, the story that I shared with that group, in one particular person, went a lot further. I felt like that connection was established, and I actually influenced their behavior, not only at work, but in behavior in their life going forward. And that, to me, was a big success. So how do you do that? You know, if you want to click to the next slide, please. Well, let me let me share a very, very quick story, you know, that happened to me when I was, you know, a, a regulator, when I was a health department inspector. And how do I use the story to, you know, to give an example of how this happened? So when I was a health inspector, there was a series of restaurants. I work in a county level, and there were a series of restaurants that were in the border with the northern state, Wisconsin. I used to work in the Illinois side of Winnebago County. And those restaurants hated to go to do the inspections for two reasons. First of all, they only opened Friday and Saturday night because they catered to audiences. They were coming uh, the, at that time. The, the drinking age in Wisconsin was lower than Illinois, so people would go there, have a good time, and then the way back, they would stop at a restaurant to you know to eat something before they got home and they didn't get into trouble with the police. But so there was a series of restaurants that would open catering to that type of audience. That meant that I had to work late at night and work hard work through the night to be able to that. So that was one of the reasons to a bit more important. One of the things that was very frustrating as a health inspector is that I never seemed to make an impact. I never seemed to get anything done. Seems like whatever I went, every time I, I found the same things over and over and over again. Very frustrating, you know, if you're trying to do your job. Um, so one time I decided that I was going to try to do something different. I said, if I can't make one change for a positive for food safety, my job is worth it. It would be like I, like I'm doing the right thing. I feel like you know it validates everything that I that I have and everything that I've done. So 
I actually grabbed the, the, the owner of, of the place and we started having a conversation with him. And I said, did you hear about this outbreak that happened that was in the news a couple of weeks back? Locally, he had. And he said, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's been in the local news and stuff like that. They actually hurt some people. Some people were very sick. And they went out of business as a result of that. And I said, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Did you know that as a health inspector, I was one of the people who did the investigation. And some of the things that lead to this is one of the things that I'm finding here. And that's how you're cooling your sauce, meat sauce. And I'm very concerned. That got his attention. Tell me more. And I said, well, in that case, you know, they were not cooling the, the meat, the, the food after they cooked that they weren't cooling fast enough. And that's what caused the problems to be able to do that. And, you know, as I looked at this and I take temperature, this is what the problem is. Long story, you know, we changed it. We, we, we really got into a good conversation that the story triggered on him. Uh, and, um, and we got to say, well, what do you suggest? And I asked him, so what do you think we should do? He said, what do you suggest? And I said, well, let me tell you a couple of things that I said seem work in other restaurants where I do inspections. One of them is you cook with less water, you know, and then towards the end of, of when you're done, you add ice, so cool it faster. These are the temperatures that you need to do that. And that would be another one steering. Anyway, we worked with together. And at the end of the, of the, of the inspection, I said, I'm going to tell you why. Now that you know how to do that, you know, I knew that he was trying to noodle how he was going to do that because he heard this story that impacted his livelihood. He heard the story and he connected immediately to it. And now he wanted to do something about it. Long story short, I gave him one of my two health department issue um, uh, thermometers and said, why don't you do it and tell me what works and doesn't work. And then I left and I went continue to do the work. Monday morning, I get back to the office and I have a call from him already. He was ecstatic and I said, Jorge, I think I found a way to do this in the time parameters that you told me. And then he went on and said, I decided, you know, I tried with ice. And then I tried with your steering and I, I, and I figured out if I do both at the same time, I can bring this curve and be able to do that. In fact, I'm so happy because now I went to buy more thermometers so I can be able to do that. And right there, guys, right there, I knew that what, what I have done had reached and I have reached the level of being able to, to get to him. I have influenced his thinking about he was going to be able to go and move forward. In fact, every time I went after that, that issue never came back. So my next step is every time I did an inspection for the couple of times that I went after that, um, then I focus on another thing, one more thing, one more thing. And I feel like this job does have a meaning. This have, can secure the safety of my customers or, you know, or the public and stuff like that. But let me, let me tell you how I can break that down for, for you guys. You know, I just give it to you, you know, very quickly into some of the things that I find it works for me and then have been very effective through my career. First of all, the audience. Notice that when I talked to the manager, I made it to care. I connected with him. You, you, that facility went out of business. If I would be talking to a manager, I would be talking differently than, 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 than the owner. If I would be talking to a frontline employee, I would be talking differently. The same way that now, when I talk a CEO of a company or a manager or, 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 or somebody with underline, I'm very careful to ensure that the story connects to something they do is something it's important to them. So being, having a good understanding of the audience is very, very critical. You can tell the same story, but the connections to them might be different. An example in the example that I just gave you, the connection to the manager was losing their business, hurting somebody, being a lawsuit and stuff like that. If we would have done it to a manager, it would have been about the, num the type of people that were sick. There were two older ladies and some babies that would be able to cut the connection because I knew that person has family. And I would change the story, same story, to make sure that the audience has some, some uh, skin in the game, at least from the story perspective. The only thing that I've done, click, click this, gotta keep it clear and simple. As a health inspector, you know, I could have talked about CDC statistics, I could have talked about all kinds of things that happened. I could talk about science and use, like Jeff said, big words and things of that sort. And that would have lost with this audience. That would have been a good story for a different audience. But for this audience, it was clear and simple. These things are dangerous. Here is the example. And by the way, this is how it could impact you. Straightforward, nothing else. You know, I didn't tell him about money. I didn't tell him about codes. I didn't tell him anything. It was very, very important for me to be able to create a very clear example. And he connected to that. The next thing about that I, that I like to use is called action oriented. Next click, please. You know, what do you want them to do? You want to make your, sure that the story that you're telling is going to connect with something they're going to be doing. 
whether it's they're washing their hands or taking temperatures or not coming in to work, it's going to be something that you're asking them to be engaged with. If you have that connection, that is going to influence their way of thinking to be able to go forward. And last but not least, click this, uh, set a feedback loop. When I talk to somebody one to one, I have the, some people say bad habit to say, does that make sense? Or what do you think? I ask him to be participant on the story. After I tell my story, I engage them to see in that, in most cases, allow me to that. Well, they got inf the information or actually they got education or in some cases too, I actually influence their thinking going forward. So I know that I'm not going to impact just when they come to the office, not just when they come to the restaurant, but actually actions that they're going to take when they go back home, when they prepare food for their, for their kids, you know, when they are uh, sharing meals with their family, et cetera, et cetera. That feedback loop is very, very important. And depending on the response that we can engage in a conversation about the actions that I ask, if, if they're reasonable, if they're not, and how they can be in, uh, influenced into their, into their behavior uh, for their non. Um, th those have been very, you know, those steps are, have been very, very good to me, to my career. And, and I'd like to share with you, you know, perhaps, you know, you, you can learn something from that. Um, and again, um, it had been an important part of how I communicate, I use storytelling to communicate the food safety messages to the audiences to make an impact, to inform, to, to educate, and hopefully to influence the way they behave in front of food for the rest of their lives. So with that, if you want to go to the next slide, Celeste, please. I want to thank you again for the opportunity. This is great. And as a feedback loop, I'm really looking forward to uh, any questions that you might have for me um, at, the, at the end, towards the end of the broadcast. Thanks a lot. Vanessa? Thank yeah, thank you so much, Jorge. Um, now it's time for our Q&A portion of the event. So I see we have some questions coming into the Q&A. Uh, please make sure that you are going into the Q&A function and typing in your questions for our panelists um, and that you're upvoting the ones that you would like to see answered. Um, you know, we usually spend a lot of time here talking um, about tips and tricks for industry and things to advance food safety culture, but I know that we also have a lot of folks from health departments on the call. And Jeff, there's a question that's come in for you um, about uh, what went well, what could have been better uh, from your perspective when you were talking to health departments um, about your mom's illness. Do you, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure. The, you know, the very first thing, like I, I mentioned, my, we thought my mom died from pneumonia. Uh, it happened right before Christmas. And in sometime in early January, I was reading a little blurb in the Associated Press. And it said a 72-year-old woman from northern Minnesota died from salmonella contamination. And I thought, that can't be my mom, but it seemed so coincidental. So what happened is I called my sister because she had received a call from the health department asking what she had eaten. And, you know, two weeks prior to that. And she said, I'm sorry, you have to hear it this way, but that's how your mother did die. So right away, my opinion of, you know, this is how I found out my mom died is because I happened to notice it in a, in a AP report. To me, that was my first experience with the health department, and I thought somehow that should have been handled differently or better, and I, and I don't know how you change that, but I guess that would be my health department recollection more than any other. So, um, Jorge, one question for you in thinking about incorporating storytelling into your mm -hmm operations have you uh and thinking about the audience that we have here today do you, have you formally incorporated storytelling in your you know food safety management system or in your you know training or in any type or any aspect of your your day-to-day -day operations so um when we're talking about training we have you know regular training i mean uh, things that, that are about sharing information to be able to do that but my team, which is the ones who oversee, I'm, I'm hoping that you're talking about the restaurants, 
oversee um, the execution of those standard operating procedures, those practices, those food safety management systems. When they go back and ensure that those are being followed, they use storytelling to be able to connect them to consequences, to be able to connect them to the things to be able to do that. So it's not formally. And the reason for that is, is uh, Conrad, is that, um, like I mentioned, the storytelling has to be, uh, Jeff said it, honest, it's straightforward, and it has to be to the audience. It's very difficult to do that in a, in a, in a, in a food safety management program, in a training program, right? You're sharing information. But what you can do is when you do the oversight, when you do the evaluations, when you do the assessments, stuff like that, especially if they're not being followed, you know, those things that are not being followed, that you can bring the group together and, and that's where you storytell and be able, you know, takes a life. That, that's when we use it the most, right? Uh, we have, uh, you know, people that they come and do that from the corporate side. Uh, and that's when they use it in the corrective of those things that are not followed. So you understand why you need to do that. Let me tell you what happens when you don't. And let me tell you a story. Unfortunately, Jeff pointed out a lot of stories in the media of things that don't go well that you can connect back to to food safety issues, whether it's hand washing or cooling or be able to do that. And, and the goal here is to be able to get the person personal connection to that issue so that you can influence their behavior going forward. And in my in my experience, it's, it's done at, at that level. It's hard to do that as, as you pull back and you have more people, you know, make it blank and you start diluting it. To that. So that's how we use it most. When we have uh, regular meetings, you know, to go over things that are working and things that can be improved. That's where we use the storytelling. That's where we, you know, that we do it most as a matter of, of, of practice. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, when you're, when you're doing that, do you focus only on the, the bad stories or do you have? Uh, not, not only the bad stories. We also use uh, rewards, you know, you know, people that have done the good thing. Um, and this is not necessarily at one has been in that job before we had a situation where, where uh, there was a, uh, a customer who came in with uh, with a norovirus, which turned out to be norovirus, and it had a problem in one of our, if I know one or one of Russians again, not now, but it was well. And in the um, the person in charge, the manager actually took followed the procedures to the max and took very good action, saving the company a lot of headaches and saving a lot of other customers for going through that. We highlighted that story too. Right. This is what happens when things go right, you know, because the health department came investigated and actually they said, we're surprised that you don't have more. Right. They, they really dig into it and stuff like that. But we attribute that because of the prompt action of the person who followed the training, knew how important it is, you know, closed down uh, the dining room. I mean, did every single step that it was trained to do. So we highlighted that story to the other people in the organization. So stories can be both positive and negative. And I think the goal of both of them is to connect to you personally, what is that to do the right thing or what is happens when you did the things that you've been trained to do the, the right things to do. So yeah, we use both. Right. And Conrad, Lone has raised her hand. So I think we should call on Lone. Oh. <laughs> So Thank you, fun. Vanessa. I'm trying to be more sort of better behaved. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the manners, Bob. <laughs> I can learn too. Um, Jorge, I'm going to push a little bit of what you're saying there uh, with the, the formality and storytelling as in incorporation into an, a food safety management system. I think stories live at very different levels and at some levels, it can easily be brought, or brought into a formal food safety management system. For example, you have your uh, management reviews, you have your food safety management meetings, uh, your, your food safety team meetings, uh, having as a standard practice that the first thing we talk about is one, um, somebody share something they've experienced in our facility or in our company that one of our colleagues did or saw or um, that that exhibits the behaviors that we're striving for seeing uh, more often. That to me is also storytelling, where you have a standard uh, first point on your agenda, tell a story about somebody that's done something that um, shows what it is that we'd like to see more of in the future. And I think that's how, Conrad, you can build into your food safety management system. And there, when you do that, it's also helping food safety leaders and others just continuously adopt the practice of, of storytelling, which um, can be difficult for some people, right? So I uh, just wanted to add that in as well. 
Yeah, that's a very good point, Lonnie, if I can make that. We, we have, we call that feedback. We don't call that storytelling. You know, you hear about something and be able to do that. And, and, and that's, that's something. In fact, when we developed sort of say, we had storytelling into saying, look, here is John. This is what happens. And it is a written uh, script of things that happen to be able to do that. So there is a lot of ways to do it, uh, but uh, targeted uh, in, in storytelling to a particular issue is, is, is what I was talking about, right? Uh, you guys are not, uh, you know, coming sick to work or you guys are not washing your hands right and stuff like that. That's where we, you know, we attack it at that level. But yeah. And, and again, you said it, there are different companies and the different ways to do it. So here's the small girl was pick what works for you. I'm just going to make one small comment there. Sorry, I forgot to raise my hand. That's how quickly I behave uh, badly. Um, but, but I think it's important that we do attach something like storytelling to our formal systems because we have two people here, Jorge and Jeff, who have uh, wonderful stories to share. They're very charismatic, both of them. Um, so it comes very natural to both of you to tell stories. It doesn't necessarily come natural to everybody. And therefore, I think the more you can formalize it and therefore prompt some of these behaviors, um, the more we can also have access to that tool. If I can just go back here, I always agree with it. But I think Jeff said it right. The best storytelling, the ones that connect are the ones that are honest. Right, they're, 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 you know, he, puts, he said he puts his heart in the sleep. Those are very, very hard to connect, right? Those are people, it's like Jeff, you know, has the courage to share his story over and over and being able to tell us that and be able to that. that that's, that's important. And, and, and that's to me the one that gets you to the level of, of influencing a lot quicker. You can inform, you, you can educate, but if you really want to influence, you got to be able to do it. You know, a, a little bit more targeted. My, in my experience, you know, you might have to experience with that. Well, I think that's a, a nice transition, Jorge. I have a question coming in from Mallory Edwards, um, and she asks, "What can you suggest for making quick connections when long-form storytelling isn't practical?" So, Jeff, maybe you want to take that first. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to tell your story quickly? Uh, yeah, I have. And, you know, uh, the second time I appeared in Congress, I wasn't even scheduled to appear. And the, the chairman heard I was there and it just so of the USDA. And it just so happened that he was from Minnesota as well. So that was beneficial. But he asked one of his interns to come out and get me. And him and I had a meeting. Uh, in his office that actually held up the entire congressional hearing. And I, I stood in front of him and he, he said he was sorry to hear about my mom. And I had done research on him beforehand, just in case I had an opportunity like that. And I knew he was an accountant at one point. And I did accountant, accountancy for uh, Best Buy Company. And he, he said, first of all, he said something I didn't agree with was he didn't want the USDA, you know, the FDA sticking their nose into the USDA's business regarding the Food Safety Modernization Act. Totally disagreed with that. But I just kind of said, uh, sure, sure, sir. And then my point was I wanted to be able to speak. And he had just had the uh, industry to, to hear that day. He wasn't going to allow speakers but what got him was I said to him, sir, I I'm very prepared to speak today. I wish you would allow me to speak. And he kind of hemmed and hawed, took off his glasses. And I said, as a fellow accountant, and that lit something under him. And he said, well, it's a bit unorthodox, but I'm going to give you the first three minutes of my time on the floor. Are you ready? And I said, sir, I was born ready. And so they let us in this congressional hearing. And I think some people that stop are watching the hearing and all of a sudden they see me getting on the panel and I'm the first speaker and they put a three minute timer on me. <laughs> so I felt like I, you know, rambled a little bit, but I got my message across. And that was because in the back of my mind, I, in my, in my mind, I knew I, my main goal was just to get across how it affected me and that was wrong and it needs to change. And so I really limited my answer or my speech to, to three minutes. And actually, I answered this question probably longer than it took to, 
to relay that story. But that that was a point of uh, being able to, you know, go on the fly, as it were. Jorge, do you have anything to add to that one? No, it's hard to add to that one. I've never been in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello. I was kind of laughing to myself thinking, I can't believe he bought that. <laughs> <laughs> that takes a lot of guys, my friend. Good job. <laughs> Long, go ahead. <laughs> Super inspiring, Jeff. Absolutely. I, I, I wanted to build on your story and also the, the question, Vanessa. Um, I think it was Mark Twain who was attributed with the saying that I, I'm sending you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short. Um, and, and I think we have to acknowledge that the best stories are those that are well prepared. Um, and and I, I think that goes into a lot of what you said as well, Jorge, in your presentation. Um, but taking the time to really uh, find those key messages. Jeff, you've obviously honed your message throughout the last 15 years and, and telling your story very succinctly. Somebody that's not used to telling a story and might not have that emotional connection, it might be a little harder and you have to lay down the groundwork to write out your long story before you can actually tell your short story. So, Lone, you mentioned writing out stories, and I know a lot of what we focused on today was the oral communication. I mean, is there any value to non-oral storytelling? Uh, you know, I know there's a question about the use of social media, but uh, which to me just opens up the question about different ways of communicating these stories. And uh, maybe, Jorge, if you've had any experience in your company um, with different ways of of sharing those stories would be great to hear. We we use social media. When well, we do that a lot, um, we use all, all kinds of, of, of uh, we call it feedback loops. You'll be able to do that. You know, we tell who's succeeding with you to do that. Um, it's a completely different way of communicating nowadays. It's a lot more not, you know, so um, uh, I, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is not the traditional storytelling as I understand it or I haven't used it in the past. That doesn't mean that it cannot be used. And in fact, you know, we, we use visuals, you use videos and stuff like that. You're telling a story about something you saw. You're telling a story of a video to that. Um, we, we use that as part of our monitoring things. You know, this is what happens. This is what we see. This is what you should be doing and all the stuff like that. Um, but uh, so, so the, the, the short answer is yes, we use it like everybody else. Um, but it's not as powerful as a list that I can see. Um, as when you are targeting a particular thing that you're trying to correct, right? Um, again, these are media, so you got X number of prints or, or things or, or, or postings or clicks or, or things of that sort. Um, but as a way to inform, I think it's absolutely right. As a way to educate, I think it has value there. But uh, as a way to influence, it's a little bit more targeted. Now, some people have done, have done that very well. They're really called influencers, right? But uh, um, I haven't seen it done in food safety. So that's, a, that's a good area to, to, uh, to uh, work on. Actually, we'd love to see some food safety influencers. Maybe you guys are. I have, I have no doubt, but that would be great. Yes. All right, maybe we see that. Um, we certainly use this quite a bit um, in education and training, uh, where you work on scenarios as opposed to um, reading a SOP or a technical script and then telling us what you learned and um, but do scenario uh, reviews and and discussions while they might not be exact well no they are stories the, the stories of, of a situation how people were impacted and then how would you make decisions differently or what did you learn that you can bring into your decision making as well so I would say that that's probably a place where you see storytelling in a slightly different format yeah, in education, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, definitely, that's something that is used a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we've got time for one last question and Conrad's gonna let me ask it. So um, thank you, Conrad. Uh, <laughs> uh, Retta asks, how do you integrate storytelling to effectively inform, educate and influence um, audiences with different cultural backgrounds? So I think that's for Jeff and Jorge. 
I'm going to say that's a good question. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> my answer. Uh, usually my audience was uh, media. And I really didn't have a lot of experience with, you know, different cultures. Um, I've spoken at companies here in the Midwest primarily uh, and never really had to deal with a, a bunch of a culture gap or potential culture gap. So I don't think I can really answer that question with any authority. Well, then, Jorge, it's over to you. <laughs> and and actually, when, yeah. while you're thinking about that answer, Jorge, I was there's other questions that I think are related and, and sort of like maybe different generations of people, like younger workers versus older workers. So there, there's a lot of differences among people in your staff. And it'd be great to hear your experiences. So, um, wow. In my experience, is you can do that, but you have to be very careful. You really have to do it carefully because you may end up insulting somebody, right? So uh, I guess my advice would be do your homework before you share the experiences, right? What it may be funny to you or what may be, it may not translate really well to others. Um, I the, the food industry is so multicultural. Right, it's not just about language. You gotta remember, it's not a. It's about feelings and how they feel about certain things and how they go about it. Uh, I've been privileged, you know, I'm, I'm Mexican, born here, so I, I've been privileged to to share my stories in Spanish or, you know, as we talking earlier today, and uh, French and other things. But I'm always careful to see who am I talking to, to make sure that I, if nothing else, I'm not offensive to something that in their culture may be viewed differently than mine. You know, as a head of a company that we're in 32 countries, this a lot that I, that, I, that I do before I share stories, especially negative stories, going from country to country to country, right? Um, you have to be very, and this is one of the things that, you know, I, I, as I was I was pushing a little bit on, John, uh, on Lone's comment, you got to be very careful in how you do that because it's got to be targeted and, and they have to be able to connect and accept it. And if you come across as uh, unsensitive to their culture or sensitive to the, the, their, their feelings, you're going to get the opposite. So um, my my advice is yes, can be done. Do your homework and, and be very careful. Don't just assume that everybody around the world is going to understand your point of view or your perspective. I mean, Lone's international, so she, she can really, really give us some advice here. Um, we come across as, as, across as the ugly American because if you expect everybody to think of you want to, to do the same thing, and, and that's not what you what you want. You want to come across as as uh, truly sincere, as honest and, and, and open. So do your homework before you do that. I, I would not do it without doing that first. Alone, we're actually out of time, but if you have something really quick to add. I, I just want to go back to Jeff's kickoff point um, and when he shared the story. I, I've had the pleasure of working for Maple Leaf uh, for 11 years before moving. And just like many others at Maple Leaf, we've told that story across the world. I think being sincere, genuine, um, and personal, then I actually don't think it matters what culture you're in. So I think that's what you need to think about. And I, I think that's a wonderful uh, sentiment to end on. Um, I wanna thank everyone for their time, including Jorge and Jeff. Uh, for coming and sharing their experiences. Um, I also want to give a shameless quick plug for our Alliance video series where we have um, developed tons of storytelling materials uh, that you can hopefully use in your own uh, industry and uh, for your um, employees to reinforce why food safety matters. And you can see we've created videos. They're for different audiences. Um, they're short. They also tell stories of survival and loss. They're developed for frontline workers. And I believe they're well-honed messages. So some of those things that we were seeing in the chat, people were looking for resources for. Um, and they also have follow-up targeted discussion questions and different materials to build on uh, the videos that you've seen. So you can go to the URL up at the top of the screen and download those. Um, also, I wanted to mention our next webinar, which will be on Valentine's Day, so a sweet treat for all of us. Um, we're going to be talking about food safety culture, our food safety management systems enough, so you will receive a registration link for that um, in our follow-up materials that are coming out on Friday. And thank you again to all of the participants and for the viewers for joining us today. Thanks so much. <laughs>